Um, my name is Rula Kuri. I am the president of the Antiochian Women of the East. And we have um, a 10 um, officers and coordinator of our board and all of us here today. Um, and uh, I would like to welcome Khoria uh, Leila Elias for our Living Faith series. Uh, we just start this last year after the pandemic start. We start this week, every month. We invite um, a speaker and uh, every month we have a different topic for you ladies. And I would like uh, all of you to take advantage and take a benefits of the topic we offer to all of you. And I would like to see you to join us every month. And um, I would like to welcome all of you again and uh, Father Don, he has a um, uh, pastoral matter and he cannot be with us. Father Don, he's our spiritual advisor, uh, the advisor for the Antiochian one of the East, the Diocese of Mid-Atlantic and the Diocese of New York. Both of them under the Antiochian the East, he's just our spiritual advisor. And I will ask Cynthia uh, Brandberg, she's our um, book club coordinator. And I will ask her to start with the Antiochian woman a prayer for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O Christ our God, we are all pledged to serve thee with our whole being. Help us to continue for thee through our church without seeking praise, without seeking personal gain, without judging others, without a feeling that we have worked hard enough and now allow ourselves rest. Give us strength to do what is right and help us to go on striving and to remember that activities are not the main thing in life. The most important thing is to have our hearts directed and attuned to thee, amen. Amen. Thank you, Cynthia. I, uh, thank you. Um, today, uh, today the, as all of you heard the gospel about the Pharisee and uh, uh, oh my God, the Pharisee and publican. Publican. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the Pharisee and the publican. And uh, as all of you know, today will be the um, preparing us to the start the start our journey to Lent. And I heard um, a small prayer from uh, the Matins, and I would like to read it and to share it with all of you, if you don't mind. Okay. Prepare for me the way of salvation, O Theotokos, for I have profaned myself with a coarse sense and cons consumed my whole life with representation but by thine intercessions, profile me from all abomination. I'm going to read it in Arabic too, if you don't mind. Sahili li manahij al khalas ya al ilah. Fa inni kad dunnistu nafsi bi khataya sam. Wa afnaytu umri kulluhu bit tawani. Lakin bi shafa'atiki. Nakini min kulli rajasatin. It's very beautiful prayer. I have a goosebump, and um, as like we today, as like this official start our journey to the Lent, and um, I wish all of you a blessed journey. And um, um, now, without any uh, further ado, we would like to uh, give the microphone to Khoria Leila Elias. And uh, before that, I ask all of you, please mute yourself. If you have any question, please leave your question in the chat. Um, our program, it goes uh, like this. At the beginning, Khuri Leila, she introduced herself. We will give her the microphone for 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes um, talking. And after that, we will open the floor for questions. And uh, anyone, if I ask a question after that, you can raise your hand or leave a question in the chat. And uh, again, thank you for joining us. And Khuri uh, Layla, um, we're so happy and we're so blessed to have you. Uh, 
um, she, she is from, she's uh, uh, our priest wife, uh, Father Elias, Father Elias. And um, thank you, Korea, and God bless you. That's the start. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rula. I, I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but let me just say a, a few word of, uh, words of thanks myself. I want to thank you, Rula, for, for asking me today, although I have no business doing this. Um, so many of you who have been to the other talks, which I have to admit, I have not had uh, an opportunity to attend. Um, you, I believe, heard Gabriella, other Christophora, um, Janet, my, my, um, my Janet chatted, um, who is Father Don's wife. Uh, I am neither theologically trained, nor do I have training in something like social work and counseling as, as does Janet. Um, and there are many other priest wives here uh, and, and I have many friends with uh, theological degrees and other degrees, iconography um, and other Christian ed counseling or training. Um, I speak with no authority, um, but what I did say to Rula, and, and let me just say first that, that uh, we uh, read that beautiful prayer. It's really like really all that we need to hear. It's the reminder of what we're all supposed to be doing. It's a beautiful prayer. Um, it says it all. And let me just say thank you to Rula for everything that you do. You know, as many of you know, I come um, from a lineage of Aona, right? My mom years ago was um, among one of the, the first um, uh, in the, um, officers. And, um, and I know the dedication and the passion and the love and the sacrifice that goes into that. I got to see it firsthand. I see it with um, our ladies at, at St. Mary's. And I just want to thank you all for being here. I have family members here. I have cousins here. Um, my childhood friend, Claudia Drake Bogris is here. <laughs> I just can't thank you all for being here enough um, and, and supporting me and all the ladies of St. Mary's. I'm literally preaching to the choir because my choir director is here. Um, and uh, I, just today, just to be sure that everyone's clear to manage expectations, so to speak. There's no preaching happening here. I'm reflecting with you. I had said to Rula when I uh, told her the, the title of my talk, which also that conversation sounded a lot like, are you still sure you want me to do this? Um, was that I would approach this as a fellow traveler on the path. I know Rula just mentioned the journey of Lent, which we're about to embark on. Um, but in general, uh, the path, to salvation. My very best friend, um, Korea Erin Kimmett, always reminds me uh, when we talk about our role as a, a clergy wife, um, that we're not in a role, we're on a path and we're all on the same path together, the path of salvation, the path um, that we direct our hearts and our minds to. So that being said, um, I am going to just say a few words about myself. Uh, let me share my screen first. So if I do this and then, oh, that's what I wanna do. Share. So now, can you see that? Can you see, yes? Okay. If yes. I, I'm gonna do it in, in presentation mode and that's okay, right? That'll... Of course, of course. Okay, okay. So my title is Reflections from a Fellow Traveler on the Path um, what I carry with me. So it's going to be really uh, sort of all about that. So bear with me. And by all means, if there's anything um, that you have to want to ask or say, you know, put it in the chat and um, there'll be time for questions at the end. Although if anyone really wants to say something, I'd be happy uh, for the ladies to allow that to happen too. Um, and just because I was very keenly aware this morning in, in liturgy, as Rula mentioned, today was um, the Sunday of the publican and the Pharisee. Um, please imagine me speaking from the back of the church, okay? Way in the back. Um, I am um, the wife of Father Michael Elias, as Rula said, in uh, Brooklyn, New York. We've been serving um, St. Mary's for uh, 19 years now. Um, prior to that, two other parishes, so total of uh, almost 35 years in the ministry. Um, we thank God. We have um, two children, uh, Marie, who's here today, and our son, Matthew, married to Jessica, and two uh, grandchildren that you'll get to see a little snatch of later, uh, Matthew and Alessandra Grace. Um, 
I work as a speech language therapist uh, for the city of New York. And, um, and, and that's all the qualifications you've got. So again, um, just, um, and, and it's funny what Rula said to me while I was trying to backpedal out of this by assuring her that I didn't really have much to add. She said, Huria, every is a treasure, which was actually very comforting and lovely. So in that yeah. spirit, if you find something valuable to take away from my little backpack that I'm about to share with you, um, then please do. And that's what I'll offer. Just as another word of introduction, a number of years ago, I attended a clergy wives meeting in which Sayyid Najan, um, Janet's brother, uh, used as a, a, an icebreaker, um, an exercise in which he asked us to pair off with someone we didn't know and to find an animal that best described us as who we are in the parish. Um, so it turns out that, you know, that was not as difficult as it sounded at first. Um, and I have such an animal and it's not just the animal I am in the parish, it's the animal I am like every day of my life. And that would be the animal. So this is the century meerkat, okay? And if you can just imagine every anxious bone in that little animal's body being on high alert, vigilant, that's who I am a lot of the time. So that's how, who you are. That's who you are being spoken to today. So, so uh, pray for me and pray that I get through this because I am pretty nervous and pretty vigilant, but just want to introduce him. You're going to see him again later. Um, that's the century meerkat, kind of always on the alert and look out. Um, I have some references today. They're on the last slide, but let me just say um, that uh, I did, uh, in the course of, of preparing some thoughts for today, but also previous, um, have used a couple of books. One is called The Ages of Spiritual Life by Paul F. F. Dokimov. Um, and I have that in the last slide. Um, Arvo Part, which is a book called Arvo Part Out of Silence by Peter Butenev um, from St. Vladimir. And this, this is a, a musician um, uh, that he's writing about. And, and this classic uh, by Father Alexander Schmemann um, for the life of the world that my husband always recommends that I refer back to. I just wanna call your attention to, I'm not gonna play it now because it's wonderfully beautiful and it's only two minutes. I'm gonna hope that they'll, this will be shared in the chat, but click on this two minute um, Vimeo of the words of Father Alexander Schmemann um, of Blessed Memory, who was Dean of St. Vladimir's um, Theological Seminary and he passed, I think, in 1983. But when you hear his words, it's as if he was speaking in the today of where we are. And we're going to come back to that today, um, what that means. And, and in his words, um, and there's beautiful music, it's very powerful and moving. He talks about a great personal struggle um, that we're all engaged in. And that every act has an impact on the world. It's a, it's a spiritual battle, right? Spiritual warfare, um, good over evil. And, and that ends up being um, a struggle with, with what's going on in the world, but more about what's going on inside here. Um, and and it's, a, it's a question of discernment. So we'll be talking about that later. Um, so just in the course of my conversations with various people recently, uh, one of whom was Dr. Anthony Bashir, whom many of you know, I was kind of throwing a couple of ideas out about what I was going to be saying. And he said to me, oh, struggle. You're going to use the word struggle. And I said, well, you know, yeah. And he said, you know, it sets up such a, um, a negative sort of feeling. He said, I think what you're coming to terms with, and this is a very Bashir thing to say, is the, the finiteness of our humanity in the presence of the God. And I think that's true. I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, I struggle with the finite, finiteness of my being and humanity in the presence of the infinite God. Um, and, and I think the other thing that's true is when we talk about struggle, it almost makes it sound like if we just worked harder, if I just, if I just struggled harder, that things would go better. And in truth, as we've all learned, sometimes it's usually about letting go of that um, and cooperating more with that infinite God. 
and working with him and allowing him to work in me. But let's not forget that there is this, um, there is a sort of um, for and against that's involved in this that I'm talking about. And Father Alexander in that little excerpt refers to the saints that went off possibly sometimes into the wilderness or the desert um, and that they lived and acted. And when they did, it made a difference in the world, which is a very powerful thought. So even more so for those of us who aren't completely in the wilderness, we're in living and moving, it's a thing for me to remember that as I take this journey that I'm about to talk to you about, um, uh, what I live and how I act is gonna have an impact on the world. And ultimately this is what makes us truly human, right? Sometimes we think about um, being human as, you know, we're only human. It's sort of the, you know, we're doing the best we can, maybe even the worst that we can be. Um, fallen, petty, easily offended, and probably even more, I am offensive to others. But what we know in reality is that what makes us truly human is to become that which we were intended. We were made in the image of God. Uh, we spend our life aspiring to become a person more in his likeness. And that's the journey. This is our challenge as we hit the road. Maybe that's a better word. It's our challenge as we hit the road. So I'll just take a quick detour here already. We've taken a detour on the, on the journey. My husband always suggests that I reread the first chapter of Father Alexander's book, uh, For the Life of the World. Um, and those passages are related to sacramental theology. So that's the notion we have um, in Orthodox Christianity, that we don't look at the world as material and spiritual, sacred and profane, good, bad. We look at everything that God gave us as um, our food, our surroundings, our, our you know, nature, everything um, as good and we offer it back to him in thanksgiving and worship, always in thanksgiving, um, eucharistically, if you will. And then we partake of it, we enjoy it, knowing where it came from um, and using it for the good of the other, right? So in my way, I'm gonna use my little version of sacramental theology. Um, so what do I carry with me? I've, I've usually got a backpack on. It's stuffed full of everything. It's the, I am one of those Mary Poppins, you know, if I could pull out the hat rack, I would do that um, because I'm always afraid that someone might need something, you know, I'll have it or I won't have it. So what do I carry with me as I travel? Um, I carry a mirror. St. John Climica said, the divine mystery is reflected in the mirror of the human mystery. The divine mystery is reflected in the mirror of the human mystery. Um, so that means that when I see myself, I see the, the person who was created in the image of God, right? Um, and usually we look in a mirror, you know, maybe just because we're trying to make sure we look good for someone, right? Um, it's just reminding me that we should love God as a smitten lover, um, that that's, that's the content of my life. That's what matters, nothing else matters. Um, so if, if God, and he does, offers himself and his son, and every person is a, a son of God, every person is. This is an explanation that um, the late Hurya Stephanie Yashi shared beautifully um, in a talk once. And if it's true that we see God by God, and that it is God who looks at himself in us, then we look at God when we look at ourselves in the mirror, and more importantly, um, when we look at each other. So I carry a mirror and I remind myself um, that my reflection is a reflection of, of God, or it should be. Um, the pure of heart see God and then God allows himself to be seen. So if I can remember that when I put my mirror. Um, also, I'm a contact lens wearer. So I carry a mirror because inevitably there is something in my eye. And that reminds me, as, as Jesus said, um, better to take out the plank from my own eye so I can better see to remove the splinter from my neighbor's eye, which was Jesus, you know, sort of cagey way of saying, just focus on yourself, focus on what you've got to deal with in your life. So I try to remember that when I look in my mirror. Um, so um, we know this, right? We, we all know this. 
Um, they're si very simple, sort of elegant, even earth-shaking, mind-blowing you know, realities that I made in the image of God, that I can see him and me, or I should, and, and, and in my fellow man, my fellow person, stands everything that we know about the world on its head. Um, I carry something for my lips. Now I have a little bit of lipstick on. I do like my dark lipstick, um, but so much, you know, being at home, I've not worn that as much, but I always have something uh, like a little bees that you see there. So I carry something for my lips. I always try to have that on my lips too, what you see on the right. Always have a, a thank you, Thanksgiving on my lips. Um, that's harder than, than on some days than it is on other days to be thankful for everything. And then indeed we're supposed to be thankful for all, all things, right? Um, but my lips, putting something on my lips reminds me about words too. The simplicity and purity of prayer um, that brings us closer to God. Um, there's, there's a quote, Father Tom Hopko, um, if you've ever heard anything that he, he says, and I would always recommend Father Tom Hopko podcasts or talks whenever you can listen to them, is he quotes St. Benedict of Inertia, that when you're in church, don't put your mouth where your mind is, put your mind where your mouth is. So if I'm in church and I'm singing or praying uh, the beautiful prayer that Ruler reminded us of that we sing now during the uh, Triodian period, um, open um, the doors of repentance, it's going to be easier to keep my mind where it should be. So I try to remember that I should put my, my mind where my mouth is when I'm in church. Um, and it helps me when my mind is wandering or when I'm engaging in a little basting, a little basting and marinating of indig indignation that I might have turning over in my head. I do that a lot sometimes. Um, and while we're on the subject, I do carry them. Um, and, and every Vesper service, uh, we, we pray this, we sing this, and we'll be doing it a lot more during Lent. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth and a door round about my lips. So, I mean, if I can remember that prayer while I'm putting the mask on, let me remember what I'm saying and to keep uh, that tongue in check. Um, you know, one of my dad's very favorite books of the, the Bible is the, um, the Epistle of St. James. And he talks a lot about the tongue and the mouth. A work of faith is controlling what we say. The tongue, St. Uh, James says, is a little member and boasts great things. Um, and to remember that the best thing to use that tongue for is, is just to say thank you. And just to go back here for a second, as that says, beeswax balm on it, um, is just the notion, which is very poetical, and I've actually heard it in a couple of different poems, um, not the least of which is Alia Abu Mahdi, who's the poet um, from uh, Lebanon, that was my godfather's father, um, that, that, my, that I might be, and my words might be, a balm in the world, a B-A-L-M in the world. Um, for indeed, what shall I render unto the Lord for all that he has done for me? The least I can do is, is watch, you know, what comes out of my mouth. So recently, um, well, actually it was a couple of years ago, I was asked to give a, kind of a talk at a, a retreat in Austin, Texas. And I learned this from one of the other women. For those of you who work, uh, you know, in, in industry and in, in um, the world, you may have heard this before. I had never heard it before. So I can a reminder that I learned from this lovely woman. Um, does it need to be said? Does it need to be by me? And does it need to be said by me now? <laughs> and so often the answer to all of those questions may be no. So I try to remember that. Does it need to be said by me right now? Set a watch, O oh Lord, before my mouth. Um, okay, I carry a prayer. And um, so I have a little flashlight there because I actually have a flashlight that I carry with me. Uh, and as many of you do, I, I, I know I'm not alone in that. You have the red prayer book, you have all different kinds of prayer books. Um, I, I'm just gonna reference my grandfather who was a priest in um, St. Nicholas, Brooklyn and also in Florida. Um, actually at the, the church where Julia Anna is. Um, and, uh, oops, and, um, he, uh, he had a, I wonder if you can see, can you see 
Well, maybe not. Um, I had a, a picture of the prayer. Uh, I, I recently had needed to go through my, my parents' house uh, a year ago, and I found uh, a series of prayers that he prayed every day, and, and they happened to be um, the, the prayers of uh, Metropolitan Philaret, um, which I will share with everybody. And it just was, uh, it was funny that I found out that the prayer that I pray every morning was the same one my grandfather prayed. Um, the Akathist to the Mother of God, The Nurture of Children, if you've ever seen that, uh, it's a very beautiful book. Um, I try to pray that and carry that with me. So just to talk a little bit about prayer as a flashlight. Um, in, in the Arvo Part book, and he's talking about music, but he, he makes an analogy to prayer that it's like a flashlight because it's with this light that you see what's there. Um, what's necessary. And it's also a little bit of a foreign language. So even a little of it and you practice it, it becomes more understandable. Um, and then it begins to feel more mutual. You feel like you're involved in an exchange. It feeds you, it opens your eyes and it becomes a measuring stick for everything else. Times, as Father Tom Hopko likes us to remind us that intelligent silence uh, is the mother of prayer. St. John Climacus tells us. Um, and, and the way Father Tom says it, if you never shut up, you'll never have anything to say. So sometimes prayer is about being silent in the presence of God, right? Um, in that faith that you're still involved in a dialogue. Um, so just a, another quote that I found to be very um, comforting to me. Um, and, and as much as uh, Father Alexander Schmemann referenced the saints, right, which we're all supposed to aspire to as well. A saint is not a superman, but one who discovers and lives his or her truth as a liturgical being. I must become prayer incarnate. I have to actually become a prayer, not just say them. All of life, every act, every gesture, even the smile of the human face becomes a hymn of adoration, an offering, or a prayer. One offers not what one has, but what one is. This is out of the Sacrament of Love, which is from St. Vladimir's Press. Um, about prayer as being the prayer of thanksgiving, right? There's that thank you again. Um, a lot of intercessory prayer, which I excel in intercessory prayer, asking for things for myself and for other people. And, and finally, not to forget the praise of prayer and the prayer of praise and glory, which I'm gonna talk to in a minute. Um, and even today, my husband, uh, in his sermon, for those of you who today or hear this again, he, he referenced a little bit uh, before the gospel about Jesus uh, um, um, joining everybody to pray and always pray and not lose heart. And he speaks about the widow and the judge, the widow who kind of keeps asking the judge over and over and over or something. And he finally does what she needs so that she'll stop, right? Um, that's the way God wants us to pray with that kind of fervor and passion. Um, it is God who will justify us in our prayer and not the other way around. So funny story about the power of prayer. Just take a little moment here to, uh, and, and please know when I share this story with you, it's not that I take prayer lightly or cavalier, but um, just a moment um, in, in my life. And daughter uh, was in her junior year of college in the year 2010. Uh, studying abroad in Florence, Italy. Um, and she did that January till May of that year. Um, as many of you know, who have children who have done that, or you've done it yourself, it's a lovely opportunity. You learn and grow. And uh, one of the things they afford students who do that is these organized trips on the weekend. Um, so that in the course of Marie's time there in January and February and March, she went to Berlin and Paris and Rome and um, the Amalfi Coast and lovely organized trips that were typically by bus or train. And everyone was together and they went on tours and they ate and they visited and they did all kinds of things. Um, and in the course of this, we sort of lived vicariously through it. And when it came to the very beginning of April, um, and we used to Skype, right? In those days, we Skyped uh, with her at various times when, when the time zones you know, were uh, convenient. And so it came to be April and she'd been to all these great places. And she said, um, I need to tell you that 
uh, we're kind of on a break soon and uh, there aren't any more organized trips now for a week or so. So everyone's doing something different. I have a friend going to Ireland and uh, someone's going here and someone's going there. And I've decided, Marie said, I'm gonna uh, hop on a plane and I'm gonna go to Morocco and visit my friend Athena, who happened to be a friend from the Antiguan village. And, um, and I'm gonna stay with her for the weekend and then I'll come back. Well, as any of you might imagine, uh, if you know me and remember again, that sentry um, meerkat that you saw before, I all the blood drained from my head. And, and I said, you know, what? You're doing what, how? And she said, oh, you know, fine. Um, Athena will meet me at the airport. You know, we'll connect and I'll go stay with her and everything will be great. And I said, no, I, I don't think that's a great idea. You know, you've really never traveled completely by yourself there. You know, really, I don't, you know, and you can imagine the conversation. Well, the conversation ended and my husband said to me, you know, she's 20 years old. She's, she's from Morocco and it's going to be fine. Um, so I started praying. So um, April 14th, I don't know how many of you remember, there is a huge volcano. That's a volcano that you're seeing uh, in front of you there. Um, that is not like an earthquake or something. That's a volcano. And whatever the name of that volcano was, because it's a very difficult to pronounce name, it erupted April 14th through the 25th. Um, and shut down effectively all European airspace for two weeks. I'm just saying. So um, when we next saw Marie on Skype, um, her first, she, she kind of appeared on the screen and said, did you have to ruin everyone's weekend, mom? <laughs> so please don't misunderstand me. I do not think I called a volcano, but my daughter is pretty sure that I did. Um, so just an interesting thing, you know, sometimes we pray for things that we think are the best um, and really God knows what's best. And, and that's a very difficult thing for me to come to grips with. I know maybe for some of you too, is the idea of praying and using heart, um, of knowing that what I'm really praying for is God's will. And I don't always know what that's going to be. Um, and praying that even when the volcano doesn't blow, that everything will be okay. Um, even if it's not okay, that's okay. And incidentally, that is the quote that uh, my husband used to say to me early in first uh, ministry in St. Elias in Sylvania, Ohio. He would walk out the door in the morning and I had a baby in one arm and a toddler, you know, and I would say to him, is everything gonna be okay? In a general way. And he would say, yeah, everything's gonna be okay. And even if it's not okay, that's okay. And I think ultimately there's a huge theological truth in that. So, oh, there's the prayer from my grandfather. Okay, so that's the prayer at the beginning of the day. Um, and you can, uh, I know you, you will have that in the recording. Um, and for those of you who know it, are beautiful prayers. And, and, uh, and the bottom there um, is the prayer of St. Ephraim, um, which of course we'll be praying during Lent. Uh, with prostrations very soon. Um, so, so what do we do? What do we do with that? We pray, we live for the other, we remember death, we're grateful for everything, glory to God for all things. Um, and we're not forced, right? Our faith is not, um, it's a gift. It's not a necessity. It, it transcends necessity. I don't earn it. It's given freely. Um, I have to want it. I have to go towards it. And I have to live my life as if I know everything I know, or rather that I believe everything I believe. Um, Evdokimov describes this as the incomprehensible respect God has for our freedom. Um, and Jesus often asked people, um, do you believe? Do you believe I, do you believe this? Not do you know, are you convinced, right? It's about what we believe. So I carry God's love. Um, it's authentic, it's real, it's reciprocal as all true love is. It gives us the freedom to reject, ignore, if we so choose. Um, leave him standing there waiting at the door. Um, Father Alexander uh, affirms that to love is easy and often we choose not to return as God love. Uh, we forget. Um, but love, uh, as beautiful as it is in that heart, right? It's difficult. It allows itself to be wounded. Um, we're healed from our crosses. Uh, Father Tom Hopko always likes to like to say, 
Um, so in, and in love in that heart um, is forgiveness. And, and actually one of my favorite quotes about forgiveness, and I, I know they're, the, the gospel and the scripture is replete with them, but one of my favorite quotes I'll just share with you is actually from Mark Twain, who said that forgiveness um, is the scent of the violet that is left on the heel that crushed it. Forgiveness is the scent of the violet leaves on the heel that crushed it. So that's what forgiveness is. Um, uh, so I carry a book, as many people do, the scriptures. I try to do that in the morning and the Psalms. Uh, just to say a word um, about Father Alexander's wife, Matushka Juliana. She addressed once clergy wives, and she had just the greatest three word quote um, when you talk about um, how to live your life. And she said very simply, turn the page, just turn the page on whatever it is that's bothering you turn the page so you can go on. I'm more of a bookmarker for those of you who, who work uh, with your computers. That's a horrendous amount of tabs to be opened. Maybe you're cringing looking at it. My coworkers look at it regularly. I'm a little bit more of a bookmarker. I hang on to things. So I struggle really hard when I read to remember to turn the page. Um, for what I am doing, I do not understand. What I will to do, I don't is what I hate. That's what I do. Um, so I have to remember that. And, and uh, I do have this other favorite quote that's from the sayings of the Desert, Desert Fathers. Um, there it is, there's that face. There's my little avenging face there. Um, is a pilgrim came across a monk on the road and he said to the monk, seeing the monk in the distance, what is it you do day up in the monastery? What do you do all day? And the monk replied, we fall and we get up again. We fall and we get up again. So that's what I do. So sometimes this is what I carry with me too. The hands on the hips. Are you kidding me? Look, that's what I do sometimes. And I have this quote that my, my friend, uh, Priya Aaron shared with me some years ago. Um, Instead of an avenger, be a deliverer. Um, of course, I can't read it there. Um, let, me, let me just... Uh, Instead of a fault finder, be a soother. Instead of a betrayer, be a martyr. Conquer evil men by your gentle kindness, zealous men, and make zealous men wonder at your goodness. This is from St. Isaac the Syrian. Instead of an avenger, be a deliverer. That's, those are words I need. That's my little avenger cape you can't see behind me. Sometimes I need to right the world. So I have to remember that. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So I fall in a lot. <laughs> so I carry band-aids with me. Um, and I try to carry the joy. This is, if you can see her, joy is one of my like most favorite characters in all of animated um, movies. And that's the um, inside out character who is responsible for joy in the brain. This is what I, I like to greet the world with whenever I can. Um, Frequently, however, you know, that's how I, how I greet the world. As I've previously said, I'm looking always to remember the joy, the wow, instead of my woes. Um, and so I carry the joy when I can. Um, and again, from the epistle of James, uh, trials on the trail, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, right? Be, uh, and things to do. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, as we said before. Remember that door? I have to remember that door. Slow to anger. So I remember, I try to remember that. I carry routines with me. So this is a little bit I'm just going to share with you, just as a special educator, speech language therapist. I know there's a bunch of you out there listening. Um, one of the things we know about uh, little people and students and adults even, um, that routines are what help us learn things and what help keep us calm, keeps us um, emotionally regulated, we can participate in our routines. And how many routines do we have in the church? But also the reminder that God comes to us precisely in the ordinariness of our daily routine. For those of you from St. Mary's who are going to a Bible study, this is from that book, God With Us, Critical Issues in Christian Life and Faith. And this was in the introduction Father Michael drew, drew us attention to. And I just 
it was just clicked with me. He comes to us precisely in the ordinariness of our daily routine, in the little moments that we do over and over again. What an opportunity. I remind myself when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm plumping the pillows for the 18th time that day, when I'm putting something away, it's a time I can be mindful of of God coming to me in the ordinariness of our daily routine, not to speak of what I could use the time for um, in, in praying for others, for example. Um, so in, in, in routines in our use in school is to create opportunities for interaction and communication. We actually teach this as a strategy. Um, interaction with who? Communication with who? Well, I could start with, with people in my life, my family, but ultimately interact and communicate with, with God. Um, we've been created for this. It doesn't feel like we're always wired for it. So you have to practice routines, right? We have to practice. It's an effort. Um, and, it, and they're not lockstep routines that never change. We always say it's, re, it's repetition with variety, right? God loves variety. So we change it up a little bit. We try to grow, incorporate something else in our, our routines, our Lenten routines or whatever they are. So that'll be one of my things I'll carry with me this Lent. I carry with me a song. I should not be standing next to this icon. This icon was, was done by Aaron Kimmett. It's at the Antiochian village, but it reminds me uh, the three holy youths, right? This is from um, the, the story that we read in, in its entirety on Holy Saturday, my very favorite service of the whole uh, liturgical year. Um, and this is that beautiful story of the three youths who are thrown into the furnace because they won't bow down right to the idol. And they say very clearly, we know God can save us, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we're just going to keep singing. So um, the holy youths chant who sing God's glory despite standing in the midst of the flames. Um, and they are bedewed um, and they form this choir. Let me remember, despite the fires around me, just keep singing his praises right? But we are not alone to do this. The Father always answers the prayer that is the request of the Holy Spirit, the very essence of the gift of God. So I can ask in Jesus' name and by the Holy Spirit. He sends us the Holy Spirit, and that's my job, is to increase my capacity for it, right? We talk about the Holy Spirit at baptism being like a little down payment, and I've got to increase my capacity, not kind of squash it. Um, and I'm going to quote Stephanie Yaji again. She used to say, wherever we go, we take our chrism with us. Like what could be more beautiful? It's right there. It's on me and I carry it with me wherever I go. So I, I try to remember that. Um, the pure of heart see God and by them God allows himself to be seen. That's that mirror we were talking about before. Helps us remember who we are and who God is. Um, I carry a water bottle with me. Um, divine persons dwelling in my soul and yours, uh, according to the capacity that I'm willing to receive them, according to my thirst. Um, God longs for us. He wants to give me more than a drop. He'd love to give me an enormous drink. And then, you know, as a Christian, I could turn in turn the world's thirst. Um, but so often my water bottle seems empty and I'm trying to fill it with other things. You all know what you try with, I fill it with things I try to. Um, but really what I want is that spring of life giving water in the world. So I carry uh, my water bottle. I carry my phone with me. I'm sorry, I do. And it keeps me connected to my network. It's a little family. So there's everybody. That's a little snatch at my grandkids, my daughter, my son and daughter-in-law. I carry with me a power cord, right? because I might need to recharge. And it reminds me that I have the power to choose. So I'm gonna tell you just a quick story about um, this very moving uh, work uh, talk that I once attended. For those of you who know anything about um, the uh, area of autism, um, and many of you may, um, may know uh, Temple Grandin, who is a very famous, very well-known um, woman now in her 70s who has autism. She is autistic um, and she's brilliant and she has dedicated her life to making uh, the lives of animals much better. Long story, but 
you can read up on her if you want to. There was a movie made about her, but I heard her mother speak once. So if, if Temple Grandin is in her 70s now, you can imagine she was born at a time when people knew even less about autism than they knew today. And we don't always know everything today. And her mother, who really um, looked everywhere for, for uh, help and for support, uh, went to a doctor. They actually were from Dedham, Massachusetts. And she said to, she asked the doctor for answers. And he said to her, you know, there are no answers. There are only choices. There are no answers. There are only choices. And I found that very powerful. And not because we don't know that there are answers in the area we're talking about today. We know the answer to everything. We know the truth. The answer to every question is Jesus Christ. And even knowing that answer though, we are still left with choices. Because when I get up in the morning, what I will do or not do to live that it matters to me what I believe in God and, that, and what is resident within me is a choice. Even knowing the answer, I still have to choose every moment what I will do or not do, what I will say or not say. And that brings us back to the discernment that we started with that Father Alexander spoke about. Will I be caught up in my woes or my wows, you know, my thanking God or my anxiety? Um, glory to God for all things, living Eucharistically. What will that look like? That's my power to choose. I carry change with me. I do. The spiritual life is like putting on a new person in the same world. Change myself, become a new creature, turn that water into wine, not W-H-I-N-E, as I often do. You know me, I don't like to complain, as I say. Uh, but we are not alone. Christ is going to fight in us and with us because he is in us and with us. Um, and I carry a to-do list always. They're all over the place. It's my daughter crazy the way I keep my to-do list. But let me just share a to-do list from Father Seraphim Soloff, who spoke about the Sermon of the Last Judgment, which is coming in a couple of weeks. He was at St. Mary's a couple of years back. And sometimes that's a very daunting sermon. You know, we know what who the least of our brethren is. We know feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison. But I, I, I'm, those are daunting tasks to do in a, a, the world we used to know. In this world, it's even more daunting. So what Father Seraphim said at that time was, there are people who need us to do something good for them. There are people who need us to protect them from something bad. And there are people who just need us to be with them, to co-suffer their Tom Hopkins. So I can remember to do that. And so that brings us to the end of this journey of the spiritual life, this putting on the new person. Um, I can rise up at the time of prayer, confirmed in the faith. Um, and, and the thing that to remember about that, and my husband just talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is um, just to remember that the destination, even though it's a journey, is always today. We live in the now. Now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, St. Paul tells us. We've already received our inheritance of baptism. We can't squander it like the prodigal son, but uh, knowing that, I do squander it every day. And it's another opportunity um, to try to better multiply him, right? Share that, that water in the world, um, share my talents. Um, and remember the boundless heart of God. Um, and, and this, this book, uh, of Dokimov, he, he talks about the boundless heart of God somehow connected to the individual need of each. This is the amazing mind-blowing nugget I'll leave you with, that God in all his infiniteness, started with the finiteness of me and the infiniteness of God, in all his infiniteness and super cosmic hugeness is waiting for me and you. He's waiting for me always. And that means he's waiting for you as well. And as we know in the parable of the prodigal son, he's usually already running towards us. So if like me, you have fallen again, let's get each other back up. Let's remind each other, let's love each other to please get back up again because he's ready to run and meet us. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From the bottom of my heart, really it's uplifting. It's amazing, like to look at you and your smile all the time. I love it. Thank you. Really, we need it. We need the bag and we need everything inside this bag okay. to, to let us survive in this life. 
Thank you, Khuriya. Khuriya Layla, I will give you like a couple of minutes. Do you want to stretch out? Oh, go I'm good. Bathroom. I'm good. I'm good. You're I feel good? like I talked. I think I probably talked longer than you needed me to, but okay. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. Okay. Um, I failed to mention a very important thing at the beginning of our um, meeting. I want to mention Khuriya Layla Elias. She's the daughter of uh, Khuri, um, Shamsiya Dallas. Her hey, mom. mom. <laughs> yes. Her mom. She was the first, the second, the second president of the Antiochian Women of the East. That time it was Corona before change it to the Eastern region. After the Eastern region, they call it Antiochian Women of the East. And she's uh, her daughter. And as she said, you know how we work hard to all for all of you for all the can woman to um, to do our best to to give whatever what we have for all of you to get benefits from um from the Antiochian woman of the east and i want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and the god rest your soul your mom and uh, she's she and the other ladies they build the Antiochian woman for us without them we are not here today Thank all God. the time we appreciate them all the time we're thinking about them and uh, now we're gonna open the floor for a question and um, and I welcome the ladies who just joined us after Khuriya Layla start uh, th thank you for joining us and uh, anyone would like to uh, raise your hand or uh, Khuriya uh, Kelly, she will read the question from the chat. Okay, any question for okay. Khuriya Leila? <laughs> I, I noticed people had written things um, during it, so I appreciate that, thanks. Yeah, Kuria, that. Kelly, she used to summarize. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for doing that, Kelly. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We're waiting for people if they have questions. I mean, a lot of people are saying that it's very beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for you sharing your faith, wisdom, thoughts and prayers, joy and love with us. And God bless you. Um, a lot of people were just really grateful for your speech. I appreciate speech. that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Kuria. Sure. Um, yeah, my, I guess I'm less than that. My, my grandfather married her, her parents. Yeah. That's nice. Thank you. I love the idea of the backpack. Well, <laughs> well done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Every one of us carry it like, mm -hmm. but now we we're gonna like start putting different things inside I our bag. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We do yeah. have a question now. Um, Kriya, what if we have to travel with a heavier expected load in life? I know, I know. And really um it's it's a it's a great question and and um I'm sure there are other people on the call who could better answer this, but I, I would say um that it's important even though it's 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 my journey, it's your journey it's not ever a journey alone. So um, we, we enlist other people to help us carry the bag sometimes, right? If we're gonna just, and I do like to beat a good analogy into the ground, um, but I'm, I'm guessing um, based on what I'm reading into, you know, your question is, is yes, in life sometimes we are, we have, it seems like a lot of crosses and, and maybe almost more than we can bear. Um, and I, I never want to minimize that for anybody. And I think that's part of what that last thing that Father Seraphim uh, said. Sometimes we need to be there for each other to help carry the load, to, to suffer, to co-suffer with someone, to, um, to be there, if nothing else than to listen um, and, and perhaps even do something more to, to find out if there's a way that I can take some of the load from you, depending on what it is. Um, but to, to always remember that we're, we're not alone, even though we end up having to be responsible for our own journey, right? We have to do our own, our own path. Um, but don't, don't uh, hope, I hope you don't feel that you are also alone in, in that. Um, I don't know. Anyone else would like to say anything too? Um, I, I and, and part of that network, you know, I have a work of, of people that I call when um, I, 
I don't presume that anything I'm carrying is any worse than anyone else. Believe me, I know that. Um, but I, I reach out and I, I use that network, you know, that, that picture of the network um, I, and, and feel that I want people to do the same to me. So, so reach out and, um, and ask someone to help carry it with you. I'd like to throw out the regrets that I carry in that bag. Uh, yeah, oh. I know. And you know what? I think that's part of that, you know, um, it's, it's one of my favorite lines. It's at the end of the funeral service, actually, but I think we can do this before a funeral, right? God forbid, is consigned to oblivion. You know, when, when we go to confession, we have our confession heard, we're supposed to really jettison all of that, right? We're supposed to let all of that go. Um, Cause it's almost, it's almost like a pride in it itself that you carry around something that you regret. But I do it all the time, Mary, and I know exactly what you mean. And that's one of the reasons I, I love that Julianne um, quote, she, she just said there with this beautiful smile on her face and she said, just turn the page, you know, just let it. Um, and I think it's harder for some of us, we're wired to hold on to our um, our mistakes or our, oh, wish I hadn't said or done that um, more than others. But, um, but it, it's, I think we, God means for us to unburden ourselves and to lighten our load um, and not, and leave more room in the backpack for the joy or, <laughs> you know, whatever else is good. Um, yes, Angela's uh, God, not giving you more than you can handle. Um, yeah. I, I was just going to mention, um, Layla, as you carry a song in your backpack, I think of um, the way that I carry an icon in my you know, bag, in my thinking, maybe a picture in my phone. Um, but sometimes when I'm feeling like the world upset about pictures I see in the world, you know, and as really an avid photographer, I'll open up that icon and it just me, calms me down, makes me feel, you know, more of the realization that we need to keep in our bodies and keep us, you know, really placed somewhere with God. You're right. You're right. You're, you're, not distracted. you're absolutely right. You know, and I, I know you made a slight reference to this before, but it really is true. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's the truth that um, when we are, um, we are over you know, sort of overstimulated or high, highly wound or we're asleep, right? We can't, um, we can't uh, learn anything. We can't do anything. We can't, um, uh, we're not gonna make any progress, um, but we have to be at just the right um, level of emotional regulation, right? And there is, there is something too that you have to be at the right level where you're alert enough to take something in and also um, be engaged. But if we're too anxious and stressed or sad to, you know, either way, it's not, it's not that, that, you know, perfect place to be able to be open to anyone, right? Or, or, or other people or God even. So whatever we need to do to help regulate ourselves, it's a very important, um, it's a very important carry, self-regulation. Hmm. Leila, I, it's Claudia. I want to thank you for sharing in particular this, but in particular, on your to-do list because I took a screenshot of it. People, because sometimes the world is so overwhelmed, it's hard to know what's the next thing that you can do to make an impact in the world. And the world needs so much of our impact, but to make it really personal and to be like, the person I can do something good for, the person I can stop something bad for, the person I can co-suffer with every day, we can do that in yes. our in our most immediate circles and in the wider circles of our world. So thank that's you very much for sharing. That. I, that's, that's, and thank you for, uh, that's exactly what I felt about it when I heard Father Seraphim say it. It was so um, manageable, <laughs> you know? That's exactly what I needed to hear. So good, I'm, I'm glad. Thanks for being here. Ladies, come on. Other question for Hori Leila? Don't be shy. Just speak out. I'm sure you have a question in your mind. Just say it aloud. I'm just, just so overwhelmed by 
all the people that were here. And, and, uh, and this is such a lovely opportunity just to, to know everybody's out there. And I really appreciate you spending your time this way. I really thank you. And all the people from St. Mary's that came in my family. And they hope to see all of them yeah. next. Yes, you next, next month. Names, so you know. <laughs> just listen, next month on July 7th at 3 p.m., we are inviting right. Korea uh, Krista West. You mean oh. March 7th, Rula? March, I hope. Oh, what did they say? I'm sorry. July. July. <laughs> take us right to July. That's okay. Oh, oh my God. I oh, four months. <laughs> March, thank you, Nancy. Yes, March 7th, next month, we're inviting Korea, Leila, uh, Korea, Krista West, Krista West, and please join us. We'll be on um, July, uh, March 7th, and March 14th, we'll have an Ask Abuna session, too. Like, you come in, and you're going to ask Abuna session. Any question you have in your mind, we're going to ask Abuna session will be on March 14 at 6 p.m. Or uh, 6 p.m. Krista, Krista West is she's very gifted, uh, not only in what she does, but in her speaking. She's, she's great. She'll be wonderful. That's great. Perfect. Encourage your ladies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any question for Korea, Leila? Uh, Korea. Leila, it's Allison. I have a question about something you said, and I didn't catch it, okay. um, but it was really short and sweet and pithy. <laughs> and um, it was something roll. about uh, the silence. Uh, do I really need to speak? Oh, now? yeah, yeah. Do yeah. I need to say it? And, right. Do it, does, it need, right. does it need to be said? Does it need by to be me? said by, by me? me? And does it need to be said by me right now? So, so I love, I love that because um, I'm definitely way too talkative and, and um, can be somewhat outspoken, but I love that. But I also ponder about silence too. Silence is important, but silence is also a sin if we're seeing someone else do something. So I wonder from your great wisdom and experience, if you could you know, talk to that a little bit because sometimes it's hard to stay silent. If yeah. you see something wrong or if you see something that isn't quite right or if you, um, if, if you disagree, but you, you know, you know, it's not right. Or I just wonder from your wisdom, if you could just right. shed some light on that. Well, and you know, and that, I love the way to phrase it, but I will speak from what I, what I know and how much wisdom is there, but I, I will say, that, you know, like, like so many things, there's a, a different ways you can, um, you can contextualize silence and speaking. And I, I would say that when we're talking about, um, you know, social justice and, and uh, you know, um, something that shouldn't be taking place at a workplace or, you know, this kind of thing, uh, we all need to figure out how we're going to make those, uh, make our, our, um, our, cause known, you know, what we feel. I, I think that what I'm talking about is, is much, what and what I engage in more is much less high stakes. You know, there are just times when I really just don't need to weigh in on something. Um, and I think we know in our hearts when there's something, uh, someone needs to be protected, right? Back to that, someone needs to have, not, have something not bad happen to them. Um, uh, you know, children, the elderly, you know, the uh, people who, who are, um, who need to be advocated for, if you will, that uh, advocating for others. Yes, it's a, it's, I think that's a, there's a long history of Christianity, you know, advocating, um, being voice, but unfortunately, um, that's usually not where I, up. you know, I'm, I'm much more uh, likely to do that in an area where they, really, you know, it's more about my pride. It's more about needing to be heard, needing to everybody know that I know something, for example, you know? Um, and I think that's where, where I uh, struggle most in my own personal life. But no, I would agree with you. Um, and there are some people who are better than this that, than others um, that to speak out against something that is evil or wrong um, is, is a good thing. Uh, but most of the day, the kind of thing that, that I, struggle with is, is um, you know, in work with, with people 
with family, you know, sometimes it's better just to be quiet and listen, or maybe say something later, not at the moment, right? Respond instead of react, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but no, I would agree. Uh, and I know you are a person who, you know, cares deeply about things as, as many people do. And I would encourage you to keep doing that. That's what I would say. Thank you, Korea. Okay, other question, ladies? I actually have a question. Um, I know for me, I, I loved I loved the approach that you had um, using the illustrations of the backpack. And I was just thinking about what kind of things do I carry in my backpack? And um, and I, I know for me, and this is in all aspects of my life, that I have these tools that I use, um, but so easily I can use those tools instead of for building for really tearing down <clears throat> and really use them as weapons instead of tools. And it's, <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind was, um, you know, what I carry in my backpack would be like a notebook. I always have paper and pen with me. Um, so I could keep a notebook of, I actually have a, um, a gratitude journal and I can use it to keep a list of things I'm grateful for, but I also so easily use that same tool as a way to keep a record of wrongs against someone that I've, I'm letting go of. And I, I guess, I don't have a <laughs> quite a clear question, um, but I guess what's kind of been your approach to, or have you struggled uh, with those things or um, in your backpack? And I, I think we, you know, it was just kind of touched on in just the last question as well, but um, a quote that comes to mind for me is um, Father Timothy Honicki, uh, he's at um, Holy Apostles in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, said, um, uh, and I don't want to mess up the quote, but it was, um, if orthodoxy is anything, it's sanity and balance. And that just spoke to me because that's exactly what I crave. <laughs> that's what I crave in my faith. Um, because I can be a very non-sane person and I can also um, very easily be very out of balance. And having that approach of where do we find sanity and balance in um in the tools that we carry and not allowing that to then be turned into weapons that we use either against ourselves or other people. Um, and just kind of what your thoughts were on that. Well, it's funny you said that um, on, on the slide, you know, if you remember that I had a slide with an emoji of me with my hands on my hips, everyone who knows me knows this is my, you know, are you kidding? Look, um, I actually had a little photo of a talking stick that I had turned into the judgment stick and that that I keep taking out of my backpack and then in the morning it's in there again. So I thought maybe that would be a joke that fell flat, but maybe I should have put it on there. Anyway, um, so yes, uh, so you have your notebook. I have my judgment stick, you know, which I am allowed the only one to carry. Um, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely, I mean, this is, this is again, this is a father, Tom Hopko talks all about sanity. That's what, you know, being, being with God and human is sanity. Everything else is crazy, right? And the world wants to tell us that we're crazy, but anyway, um, you know, easier said than done. So I think that's basically what I would say to you. Yes, much easier said than done. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, there, there's a, I guess there's a school of thought um, in, the, in the paper world that sometimes you write something like that uh, or write what you might say in response and then, you know, you rip it up or whatever, you know, because you got it off your chest or whatever, but you didn't send it and that kind of thing. So I, I, I would say, you know, that exactly what you said, there's a, a balance. Um, it's hard not to remember. That's the basting I was talking about. I'm very good at basting the indignation roast, you know, that I sometimes have going. Um, but uh, that that's, yeah, it's just a waste of resources, really. Um, and, uh, and waste of space in the bag when there's just so much else to put in there. So uh, I, I think, I think trying to, to keep a balance and, and to remember that, like, turn the page, especially when, because you're, you've got a journal going there. I would just like turn the page over and, and start writing anew um, because that's what I try to do. And I know it's hard, but that's what I would, that's what I would say. But I kind of wish I'd left the judgment stick picture in there now, <laughs> but anyway. Thank you. I have a question or a comment. Hey, Val. Hi, Lula. This is just 
so beautiful. I'm taking notes because I don't want to forget a word. Oftentimes, you know, in church, I'm trying to take notes when Father Michael's giving a sermon, but it's hard on the back of a bulletin. But I had a book here, so okay. I was able to take notes. And we'll refer back to it. My question, and then I have a, what I think my own answer is, is, okay, number one, and I don't mean this only on a purely physical term, but how is it that you get more and more beautiful every time I see you. And I mean this literally. And I think- Did I say that I stocked the pond? Rula, I stocked the pond today. <laughs> I think the answer is twofold. I think it's that we are seeing the beauty of God coming through you in everything you do, including your countenance, number one. And number two, my personal feeling is when we icons and, and they are saints and they have the icons of saints, and they have a halo. I think what it is, is the glow of their hair that just off like a, 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 a halo. And maybe that's part of it because you just look more full than ever. Oh, well, you're very kind. Thank God. I actually I agree with you. You should all know, I actually have one of these O lights here. <laughs> that's, that's partly doing it. Well, so there is a man in the curtain, but, um, but yes, thank you, Gallery. It's true, Leila. I agree 100%. Like your smile so, so is shining someone, in all of us. Someone wrote here um, that I don't have any food in my backpack. I I did um, I I did actually toy with that because right before um, when I started this, it was before Halloween, and I had bought my grandson a little uh, M&M heart, and I was going to hold it up and shake it that it had M&Ms in it because I have a heart outside, but I also got M&Ms. But then I gave it to him, so I didn't have it anymore. Always have snacks, usually chocolate you know, lifesavers, but I just, I, I guess I could have worked that in, but yeah, I always got snacks. Don't worry. Always snacks in there. Mm -hmm. Big snacker. Um, not even a power bar. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Hey, Father Don, thanks for making it here. I know you, so what a, what a long day you've had, I'm sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Um, I have a question for you. Can you, uh, you mentioned the judgment is thick. Yeah. Can you say more about yeah, the judgment? Yeah. So, thick? so, so those of you who, who uh, work with small children or, you know, older children or even uh, corporate, right, settings, there's this idea that the only person who's allowed to talk has something called the talking stick, right? And when you are holding the talking stick, you're allowed to talk and then you pass it to somebody and then that oh. person is allowed to, to talk. And by the way, what a lovely group of people, because sometimes when you get a lot of people on a Zoom, everybody's talking, right? So what a lovely group. Um, so, but in my case, I turn, since I'm always talking, I, I think of what I carry as a judgment stick. Like, not that I, you know, use it on anyone, but it's something I sometimes, you know, this, this harboring, uh, um, as um, uh, Colleen was saying before, you know, when we sort of harbor uh, things that have, you know, small uh, offenses and things that have happened to us and, you know, indignations um, that sometimes it's as if I'm walking around clinging to them. And that was the way I embodied it was in like the, the judgment stick versus the talking stick. But it really, it could be anything, you know, that, um, that makes us hold on to things, um, right, that aren't really helpful, uh, you know, it, it's, it only hurts us and it just take up, uh, takes up space in our head and our heart and our bag and everything. So that's, that's all I was uh, referring to when I said that. Okay. That's no, okay. Like a Thank visual. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, ladies, now it's 4.18. Yep. We still have 10 minutes. Any question for Horia Leila, Elias? Just appreciate everybody's uh, patient attention and Cynthia, go ahead. Oh, uh, Maria Leila, thank you for this incredibly moving and inspirational talk. Uh, there was one thing, and I I sort of played in my own mind whether to ask about yeah. it, um, but in the end, I decided, well, I'll go ahead. Um, you, you mentioned at the uh, beginning, and I'm just kind of going back to the notes, but you mentioned that you were talking with, I believe you said Dr. Anthony Bashir? Yeah. And 
kind of this uh, instruction not to focus so much on the word struggle, mm -hmm. because it, you know, could have the, and I, and I can see where that could be true, but, you know, I keep, so part of it is just thinking about in my own life that one of the things that makes, I guess I have regret for, or that I, that I regret is that I didn't realize early, earlier on, you know, for instance, in my childhood, I didn't realize that struggle and suffering are part of the Christian life. And, and I often hear people will say, struggle is victory. So it's like, if you are struggling and, and without kind of going into it, but uh, sometimes people will say to me or women in particular will share with me a, a particular thing that they're struggling with. And I, I always feel blessed by that because, you know, there are really difficult battles, spiritual battles that are going on. And, you know, at the moment we happen to be reading the Holy Angels by Mother Alexandra and kind of, you know, talking about spiritual battle in terms of the angels of light and the angels of darkness. And so I'm just very interested in, you know, maybe exploring this a little bit more, because as I say, in, in many ways, I wish I had understood in my own life that, that struggle is okay, that not only struggle is okay, but it can, it can be actually the very place we need to be. Right, right. Well, thank you for having the courage to, to ask that question. And, and in, a, in just a few minutes, I'm going to defer to Father Don, but let me just say a few things <laughs> be, on, be on deck there, Father Don. Um, yeah, I, I, and I agree, you know, and, and I, I, we all well know, you know, there is spiritual warfare and, you know, it's in the gospel to, you know, to gird ourselves within the, the, the armor of righteousness and the gospel and all, you know, I, I don't have that quote in my fingertips, but you know the quote I mean. Um, absolutely. Um, I think in, in this instance, in the context of this though, and, and let me just say also as an, an educator and, and um, a keen observer of small children, um, we, we do know that when children struggle, right? And they learn endurance, right? And, and obviously over their head, but that when, when kids uh, master something, there is a bit of struggle that's, in, uh, you know, obviously um, that's what learning is, right? Something is more difficult and then conquer it it allows us you know so so what do we mean by the word struggle um and and i do think you know i mean jesus basically told us you know in this world you will have tribulation right that's that i have overcome the world so i think it's again you know to, to go back to what colleen said there's the balance there you know there is there is this notion of struggle in in the world um uh, but to, to not sort of over emphasize that in, in, in favor of, um, of a, a positive view of it. But yes, absolutely, there, there is tribulation um, and, and each of us have crosses that we, that we struggle with, if you will. Um, and I guess in, for the context of, of the, the talk, um, I wanted to, to think maybe about the journey as difficult, you know, as journeys can be, um, but not as maybe a constant state of, of struggle. Um, but I, you know, especially if you're engaged in a book in which you're delving into that, you know, that'll be sort of a different context and a different sort of um, uh, way to look at it. Father Don, I, I don't know if you wanted to say something or. What real, if I may, just because I wasn't here at the beginning. Yep. What? I'll just, I'll just be real, real brief in the beginning. Um, I had, you know, my, my topic was about my journey, you know, my path, uh, right. what I take with me, what I carry with me. Right. Um, and that when I was talking to Anthony Bashir and talked about the struggle on the path, and also in, in the quote that I'm sure you've already heard, the two minutes of Father Alexander that recently St. Vladimir sort of sent out to everybody, he talked about the struggle, the good and evil discernment in the world and all of that. Um, and Anthony, you know, just said in his way, you know, struggle, maybe don't use that word, you know, <laughs> and, and he talked 
um, what you're what you what you what you're facing is the the finiteness of being human versus the infiniteness of God, you know, and, and trying to to um, sort of reconcile those two. There's there's a bit of a struggle involved there. There's a journey. There's a there's an effort, if you will. Right. We talk about a effort, lent an effort. Um, but just, you know, he just, uh, uh, you know, instead of, sure. and so Cynthia's question about struggle. So go ahead. Okay, right. What helps me a lot, I know what helps me a lot is um, I just, I love the paradoxical nature of our faith and, and how paradox just is, um, you know, the world tends, I mean, the world identifies or acknowledges that there's something such as paradox, but I don't think that the world, so to speak, connects it much with faith or anything like that. And um, I find that to be very helpful. I mean, just like, again, when you mentioned uh, earlier and there were, you know, there's the, um, and Colleen mentioned about, uh, balance and uh, what was the other balance and sanity, balance and sanity. And just, you know, it's kind of like, I remember the first sermon I ever gave was on the Sunday of the publican and the Pharisee in 1982. And the reason I remember it is because I was so scared to death get up and talk in front of St. Anthony Bergenfield. And um, again, I think Leslie was there. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I remember it though that, and from Father Schmemann's book on Great Lent, where he, de he describes Jesus Christ as the divine humility incarnate, divinity and humility on the same mm -hmm. level, same playing field. And that again, to me, is the wonder of our faith. So when we talk about struggle, even, you know, it's kind of like the other thing is too with, and I, I don't mean to digress, but in the in the Orthodox Church, we're very uh, we're very um, cognitive and 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 we stress, we we try to acknowledge that there is something as the time without time in the church, and that's actually the word kato, and that the that's the, the word that's used for the description of service of prayer that the priest starts with on Sunday morning before he vests and before he does the proscomedia and that prayers. And so, and I'm bringing this up because again, even in the liturgy, when we say that we acknowledge the events of Christ's life, the ascension and the, uh, uh, the, the resurrection, the ascension and, and all of these things, we include the second coming as if it's already happened. And so again, the kind of world that we live in in the life of the church, and even when we address struggle, we're not just talking about something that's that's going to begin here and end there, but 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 struggle is, is 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 existent with us, is present with us, even while we are celebrating the resurrection, even while we're celebrating uh, the ascension or Pentecost, you know. And um, I just I just understand it all in terms of the paradox and in terms of again uh, that whole kind of that we that we embrace. Doxy, that when we enter into the worship of the church, really, there's no such thing as time. There's no 930 in the morning or 10 o'clock or 1030. There's just, it just is. And um, so even with something like struggle, that's how I, I, I kind of embrace that, you know, real quick too, and I'll close with this. Um, some years ago, um, and the ladies here, some I'm sure will remember, we had uh, Bishop Nicholas as our speaker at the Antiochian village. And Bishop Nicholas, we were sitting in the uh, library, I remember, and he asked a question, and I was glad I didn't answer it because I would have been wrong. But he asked the question of the ladies and he said, what is your ultimate goal as a Christian? As an Orthodox Christian, what is your ultimate goal? And of course, most people raised their hand, they raised their hand, most people said, heaven. My goal is to get to heaven. And he said, eh, wrong. You know, and I, that's why I was glad I didn't answer heaven. But what he said was this. He said, the goal is to finish the race. Is to finish. The, and St. Paul speaks about that. You know, if we finish the race, we receive the crown. So, and that helps me tremendously, too. Because when you talk, well, like Kuria Leila, when she mentioned that story about what do you do in that monastery all day? And I remember, I think, was it Father Tom that told us that story, Father Tom Hopko? Uh, because... I remember, if I remember correctly, it was almost like he had done, he mentioned the person that asked that question. When I, what I remember is he mentioned it kind of like the person was 
almost trying to trap the monk, you know, into saying, what are you doing in that monastery all day kind of thing. And then that monk just repeated it over and over. We fall and we get up. We fall and we get up. And I remember when I heard that from Bishop Nicholas about our ultimate goal is the, is the, uh, is to finish the race. I shared that just a few days later on Holy Wednesday, I remember, because of the connection with and Holy Unction and that. And I just shared about how that just helps me too. I mean, because when I fall, I guess I got to get back up again. And of course that occurs over and over and over again. So there is struggle in finishing the race. So we've got the resistance, I think, of all these things. might seem opposite, you know, to the world, but they are important and they can coexist together. So that's kind of my take on that. Thanks, Father. Thank you. And I appreciate your, your bringing us back to the race, which brings us back to the path. So that was great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Don. Thank you, Khuriya Leila. Um, now it's for Thierry. Um, I'm going to give Jan one more chance, last question uh, for Khuriya Leila, if there is no question. And I would like to uh, say some announcement. Um, as any question? No? Okay. Um, as most of you know, next month, March, is going to be the Antiochian Woman uh, Month. And uh, that month, we ask all the Antiochian women to be more involved in their churches. I know with pandemic, we unable to, most of the, most of the ladies unable to attend. They do through um, virtual Zoom um, uh, online, but we can do something like uh, through Zoom. Um, we, I'm sure each church, they have their own activities. And uh, the Antiochian one of the East, uh, we organized for you a full month of activities. We're gonna start with uh, March 7. March 7, as I said before, Khuriya Krista West is gonna be our speaker start at 7 p.m. And that weekend, it's a DMC, uh, that weekend will be a DMC retreat. Um, as um, normally every year we have annual, we have a gathering at the Antiochian village for our spring retreat. We've been doing this for years and years, maybe, uh, maybe 40 years or, uh, less than that, since the Antiochian woman started, they start uh, the retreat at the village, and we keep we keep, we kept it going until today. Every year we meet at the village, and we have a retreat for the ladies. Will be for three days, as you know. Like now, uh, through pandemic, we cannot do that. Um, we're gonna meet uh, virtual, um, just only that Sunday, March seven, at um, uh, at the three p.m. for Krista West. And next Sunday, the following Sunday is going to be March 14. We're going to meet with two abu three abunas. We're going to be Father um, John no Nozel. He's going to be our speaker. And Father Char Baz. Um, and Father Don. Three of them we're going to meet as, as abuna session is going to be at 7 p.m. It's going to be at 7 that day, March 14, if I hopefully you write it down and gonna send email out for all of you. And um, if you are not, uh, if your email not with us, um, uh, make sure to ask your uh, church president. She will forward the email to you. And after that, uh, after March 14, uh, March 21st, um, March 21st, remind me, ladies, we have two more Sundays. Yes, yes, okay. yes, March 21st, we have the book club. Um, the Antiochian Women of the East, we started the book club, um, the Holy Angels. Cynthia, can you put, please, the book club of mine, of my book, I don't know where it's disappeared. Um, that it's a holy, the holy angels, but uh, by Mother Alexandra. Thank you, by Mother Alexandra. She wrote this book, and um, uh, his um, his uh, uh, Grace Bishop John and uh, the religious coordinator for the NAB. She asked us to read this book for the all the Antiochian women in our archdiocese and uh, the Antiochian one of the East, we, um, we the, this is the first time we um, held a book club and uh, we have a book club coordinator and we meet once a month 
and uh, we sent out the email out for all the ladies and i um and we have a facebook for the book club uh, you can join us on the facebook to for more discussion if you are interested to be in the book club please leave your email um, or your uh, name your email address in the chat down there we will get your email and you can you can join uh, us in the book club and um, uh, second thing um, we the, we record we record uh, the um, each each time we have event we record it um, and uh, we publish it on our YouTube uh, channel and I would like ask each of you to subscribe our channel to to listen to the record we since um, Ma no April since April last year every month we have a speaker you can go back and listen to Korea Fadrika Green and Korea uh, Jan Janet Chadid um, there. Uh, Mother Gabriella, Mother Christophora, Mother Magdalena, and Bola, and uh, there's a lot of uh, speakers. We invite them. Last uh, last month we invited Elizabeth. Um, you can go there and listen to the speakers of the past year. And um, uh, March 21st is going to be the book club, and March 28th, March 28th, it's a special day for the all. Um, we make it a special for our Khuriyat and we'll be going to be appreciation day for our Khuriyat, for the Antiochian women of the East, for the two dioceses. We're going to invite only the Khuriyat and the best president. We're going to meet to them um, for appreciation day. Um, as uh, we're going to all these uh, events, we're going to send them out by email. To all of you, if you're interested to be in our email list, please put it down in the chat. We will, uh, we will add you to our email list. And uh, if you would like uh, to uh, join us on our Facebook, you can go to the Antiochian Women of the East Facebook. You can join us there. And we have an Instagram too. And uh, I ask, please, each of you, if you have an event in your church, please share it with our page. We would like to share it in our page or ask us or email me or email, um, uh, you go to the, our website, the Archdiocese website to the Antiochian one of the East, our email there, our information there. Easy to access, we are easy to access. Just ask about Rulakuri, easy to find me. And if you would like to, to, to post any event in our Facebook, we have the um, uh, best and Hyatt, uh, Shamsiya Beth and Hyatt, she's our uh, social media. She will help you to post uh, your, um, your event. I think I covered everything in uh, for March and I wish you um, all um, uh, blessed, uh, blessed the journey for the length and from the bottom of my heart again. I thank Korea Leila Elias. Really, it is uplifting. Really, it is. Um, I felt uh, I am. I'm so happy from inside to listen to you, to listen your your word, your wisdom, your information, your knowledge. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, God bless you. Grant you many years. And uh, I hope you will get to see all of you to be with us next. And the um, last word will be for Father Don Shadde. Um, he is our spiritual advisor. He's going to uh, close our meeting with a prayer. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Habiti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, you're mute. Father Don, you're mute. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask now as we bow our heads unto thee for your grace, your mercy, your compassion, your joy, and your healing. Especially now as we draw ever closer to Great Lent. We ask also that you watch over Kuria Leila and her family and loved ones. We thank thee for blessing us with her and with her sharing of her heart and her, her soul. We pray that you will open our ears and our minds, not only to each other, but most especially to thy will. 
through these gatherings in which we celebrate you and the love that you have for us, O Lord. We praise thy most holy name, thanking thee for all things, asking that you watch over us until we meet again. We pray for these things in thy name and that you grant us thy peace, not the peace of this world, so temporary and fleeting, but only that which can come from above through the power of thy Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen.